Hello and welcome to the classic Liège Baston Liège. A journey through the Belgian Ardennes of 160 miles as we race from the start in Liège to the finish just outside of Liège in the town of Ars. I'm Phil Liggett. Alongside me is Paul Sherwin. Paul, apart from the weather here in the Belgian Ardennes, this race is so different to the flatter cobbled roads of northern France and of the Flanders area of Belgium. It calls for a different type of cyclist. Yeah, this is the first time really we start to see the guys who are getting themselves ready for the Tour de France. You take away the cobblestones of the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix and you replace them with the hills of the Ardennes. So the 160-mile route starts with about 60 miles of uh, undulating ride as the riders move away from Liège. There's just one small climb on the way down to the town of Bastogne, which we call the turning point, and that's the Côte de la Roche en Ardennes. And then it's the repetitive nature of the 11 climbs that make up Liège-Bastogne-Liège. Probably the most well-known of them is the Côte de la Redoute down towards the end, and to finish it all off, the Côte de Saint-Nicolas at three miles to go. Well, everybody has a favourite, and the talk here is that this is the most open Liège Baston Liège for years. There doesn't seem to be one outstanding favourite, but one man the Belgian would love to win is Philippe Gilbert. Last year, he was on a runaway. He won all three of the Ardennes Classic races. His season ended with 24 victories, and this race runs very close to where he lives here in the Belgian Ardennes. One of his big challenges, though, could be Jacquim Rodriguez. This is the man who ran away with his first victory in Flesh Wallon, and he now is set to do what we used to call the weekend double here. But, of course, there are others. There are a lot of others. Andy Schleck coming back to a little bit of form. Third place in the Liège Baston Liège last year, looking for something better this year. And, of course, his brother rode well as well. Second place for Frank Schleck last year in Liège Baston Liège. And watch out for the American Garmin Barracuda because they've got Dan Martin, who was recently sick in the flesh well on and of course they can count on the big Canadian rider that's Ryder Hazerdahl. That's right Ryder Hazerdahl shows some terrific form in flesh well on and I'm sure he now is licking his lips coming here and let's not forget the 40 year old Chris Horner on team Radio Shack Nissan. Earlier today this is what happened a crash here by Simon Geschke this was the leading group uh, of riders they formed and built a leading group of seven men when they were left a uh, poor old Geschke here but he he looked as though he was down and out, Paul, and then up he gets, thumbs up, and on he goes. Now we join the action just inside 50 kilometres, 31 miles from the finish. We're heading on to the slopes of Montieu. Well, these riders are really survivors of that six-man breakaway that formed very early on. Built a lead of 11 minutes and 30 seconds, but there's not a lot of that left at a minute and 13. In fact, I think the reinforcements from the rear, Pierre Roland, David Lulay and Vasily Kirienka, are going to add some extra firepower to this leading group. But this, Phil, is the Monteux, the summit of which is 31 miles to go to the finish. And sat at the back here is Kevin Ister here as he's now starting to struggle on the climbs. They're starting to bite into those legs because the breakaway formed very early on this morning on the way down to Bastogne. The turning point of Bastogne is not the halfway mark of the race. Uh, they still have to come on the way back before they get through half distance. There's the peloton now and consistently under the escort, Team BMC centre there with the red helmet on, doing a lot of driving at the front now and other teams willing to help. And again, we've seen the constant pressure of Katusha Paul and Katusha did so well in Flesh Wallon to guide Rodriguez to the win there. I think what most of these teams want to do, Phil, is they want to pull the race back before the Côte de Laredoux. That's the next climb of the day. That comes at 21 and a half miles to go to the finish. And that's the moment where, in the past, Philippe Gilbert has used that as a launch pad to victory. And that's why we can see these riders are from the American squad, BMC Racing, doing most of the pacemaking for them. Their race will probably finish once they get to the foot of the Côte de Laredoux. Well, the big man on the front there was Brent Buckwalter, the 28-year-old who comes from Athens in Georgia. He really is one of the strong men on that American BMC squad. He's not here to win the race for himself, but for his team today. And it looks as though Istel is falling back here, so he's going to see the bunch before anybody else in that breakaway. So that's two men lost in the breakaway now. Simon Geschke, who we saw crash, he's gone back into the field with his right eye bleeding. And now Ister is coming back as well. 
but you know this race, Paul. You've ridden this race. These next few miles are so difficult. Well, this Mont Tour is a very, very nasty climb in itself because you see it from a long way up. Now, this is a bit of a surprise to me because there on the left-hand side in the uh, national champions jersey, wearing number one is Philippe Gilbert, hand in the air, Phil. I would think he's probably got a mechanical problem. He doesn't look to be uh, too much of a panic for him, but all the same, you shouldn't really be at the back here. What we've got, Paul, notice the roads are wet now. We're going in and out of these April showers this week. They really are very, very cold, these uh, showers, when they do come down as they start to go. He's the far side there in the Belgian champion's jersey. He's, you see him squeezing there. He's actually turning on his microphone to talk to the cars behind. He's going to go round riders who are actually not going back voluntarily, and he's anxious to get some assistance before that bunch starts to ride away from him. He's looking for his team car, here he comes. I think he's looking for a rain jacket, Phil, here, because if you can see the little spots of rain coming onto the uh, the lens of the camera here, it may well be that he's suffering from the cold here. You normally get stripped down as light as possible at this stage of the race, because you know the race is about to begin, but maybe the cold is starting to get into those muscles of Philippe Gilbert. Well, Jean Lalonde, the manager there, handed him back his sunglasses. He thought he wanted them wiping, I think. Uh, but Gilbert says, no, I don't want the sunglasses back. They're now arguing exactly what does he want. He's going to come from the back of the car. Well, he's not looking very oh, happy there at all. Back. He gets the sunglasses back on, but I think he wanted to get himself warmed up. That's Armel Moana, the uh, rider alongside him. And a lot of discussions going on. Strange to see, while Philippe Gilbert, the team leader, is panicking a little bit at the back, his team still have confidence in him being able to put in the form when it comes to the Cote de Laradoute in around about eight miles' time. But you see the benefit here of a team. Now, this is Brent Buchwalter, the American from Athens on the front, talking on his little radio. His job is to slow this group down while his team captain is at the car behind, deciding what he wants, and that's what he wants. He wants arm warmers because of this ice-cold rain. Well, you know, Phil, this is the Ardennes, a very famous, made famous in 1944 in the Second World War because of the Battle of the Bulge and then the Americans were fighting the Germans in the wintry conditions and that's the amazing thing about the Ardennes here once this rain comes down it becomes absolutely freezing these are the seven leaders now not that far ahead of the field as they're heading onto the slopes of Laradoute and this is the steep climb of the day leaving Remachon now let's have a look what happened moments ago here Paul because Andy and Frank Schleck seem to be in a spot of bother at the back of the peloton well, with 42 kilometres to go, that's around about three miles before they get to the start of the Côte de Laradoute. Andy Schleck, who we're looking at here, Phil, seems to be messing around with his radio to make sure he's got good communication back to the team car. And there's his brother Frank just a little bit further back. This is not the ideal position to be when you're leading up to what is everybody regards as being the most important strategic point of Liège-Bastogne-Liège, the Côte de Laradoute. Well, that was before they got to the climb, but on the climb now, and they are still at the very back of this field, which surely will split on the climb. Look at the crowd here. This is the iconic climb of Liège, Baston Liège. It may not be the most difficult. That could be reserved now for the Rocheau Fousson, which is still to come. But just by the way, uh, if you're just looking down to the side there of that picture built, that in fact is an auto route, and it's only in Liège, Baston Liège. The police just give up and they let the cars park there. This is the front end of the main field now, getting themselves into uh, in a situation to attack this climb, to try and pull back these leaders. We're looking, once we go over the top, to 21 and a half miles left to go towards the finish. Oh, this is Thomas Vogler, number 131. It looks as if he's got a little bit of a problem. He's got good form recently, uh, Thomas Vogler, because he was just recently the winner of the Flesch Brabazon, or should I say the Brabazon Arrow. Yes, and look at the work being done here now by Team Green Edge, the new All-Australian pro team, although the riders aren't All-Australian, as they now drive this peloton, which is clearly fragmenting. This is crucial now. We're only 36 kilometres from the finish. It's about 22 miles still to race, and this is underneath the motorway. Then it really kicks up. Well, that Garmin Barracuda rider on the right-hand side, in fact, that's Alex Hauser. He was uh, originally born in Golden, Colorado, now hails from Boulder, Colorado, and just recently he finished in sixth place overall in the Flesh Brabazon, so that's a good indication of form. Alessandro Bazan had been in the breakaway all day from Team Type 1, the American squad. Been a pro since 2007, but he hasn't won a race, and he's out of the back of the breakaway now as Katusha are beginning to tighten the screw at the front of the race here 
They'll be racing for Rodriguez once again. Yeah, but in the middle of that line of riders at the front of the peloton, Phil, you can see that tricolor of the Belgian flag. And of course, that is Billy Gilbert. He's waiting for his time, biding the time to attack because the Cote de la Redoute, yes, it's a difficult climb to begin with, but it's much more sticky once you go over the top. Well, just coming up to the Katusha rider here, it looks to me as though it's Alec House here who is the rider from the United States. He was born in Golden, but he lives in Boulder, Colorado. He's only 24, Paul, and they're talking about this young man as a real star of the future. No, they certainly are there. You can see Philippe Gilbert looking around. He's got the uh, multicolored helmet sitting at the front of the peloton. He's in an ideal position, but there are an awful lot of riders in the right red and white jerseys of Team Katusha queuing up onto his wheel. They know he's a big favorite for today. House has caught up there, two with the Katusha rider, six in the flesh Brabanson, which is semi-classic here in Belgium. And he's looking very cool now. He's come round that corner and he will see how this hill really does kick up. The flags are indicating the wind is gentle. It's slightly across, but the crowd will protect the riders here. As we look at the leaders, the rider in green at the front, Pierre Roland, and if you think you recognise him, you probably will. He's the man who conquered Alpe d'Huez and won that stage in last year's Tour de France. And what a great victory that was. He's a climber. He certainly is an excellent climber. These two riders now starting to open up a little gap. There is a reaction coming at the front end of the main field. And once again, it looks like it's the black and red jerseys of Team BMC Racing. They're trying to keep this race together for Philippe Gilbert, but that's not a good sight to see either, Bill. One kilometre still to go to the summit. Which is six-tenths of a mile, by the way. As we see now, the peloton closing in, but it is getting smaller. The road's very narrow here. It looks to be a lot more rides than I think are in this bunch now. Gilbert is second in line here and is looking very, very strong all of a sudden as the riders now begin to slowly split up. Well, they're getting dropped off one by one at the moment. I think that was TJ Van Garderen on the front for Team BMC Racing, sacrificing himself today, Phil, for Philippe Gilbert. But Gilbert, by the way, lives about four miles away from the bottom of this climb in the small town of Aywala, but everybody believes that he actually comes from Remouchon, so we might as well accept that. Well, TJ Van Garderen has joined Team BMC this year, and he's joined it now to help Philippe Gilbert try and fly the flag for both the team and his country. We're very close to Gilbert's house at this very point. This is David Lallet. He was in the breakaway, Frenchman. He's now been dropped by the leaders, which is cracked right up here on Laradute. But look at the work being done by TJ. He really is working strongly. Sitting on his wheel in second position, that's the champion of Belgium, his teammate Philippe Gilbert. Just behind him is Yellow Venom there. A lot of people saying he could be the big star for the revelation here this afternoon. But when you ride at the top end of the sport, oh, there's a problem here again now. This could very well be Alejandro Valverde just going by there. The French national champion, Sylvain Chabanel. Valverde swapped bikes there with his teammate and he tried to get himself back into this bike race. Well, Valverde there, one of the two men riding this race who have done the double of Flesh Wallon and at the Lineage Bastogne on the edge in the same year. The other one, of course, was Gilbert last year. But Valverde all day has been at the back of the race and I think that has put him in a bad position for that problem. Well, I think hailing from Spain, he doesn't really enjoy this kind of weather. It is uh, icy conditions out there as we go over the summit now of the Cote de Laradou. These riders getting themselves nice and organised, but they know they've still got two very nasty climbs to come. Next one will be the Cote de roche au Faucon and the final climb of the day, the Cote de saint Nicolas, which is just at three and a half miles to go to the finish. Well, a man from Montana there, TJ Van Gaard, has done a sterling job up the slopes of Laradou. He really has protected his uh, leader and champion of Belgium, just sat in behind him in second place, giving him a nice ride up, as if you can climb these steep climbs so easily, and he's guiding him to the top now. Well, I just noticed a little bit further back there as well, Damiano Cunigo in the uh, pink jersey of Team Lamprey. Now, he's the kind of rider who create the surprise at the end of the day because he's got a great acceleration, and this race finishes up a very long drag into the town of Ons, which is on the outskirts of Liège. But looking at the way these boys are climbing this now, they have split the field. Some of the favourites have missed it. I can tell you two of them I haven't seen. Frank Schleck, because he was caught at the back, and Valverde, who's had that problem. Two big names aren't here. The other big names are, and TJ Van Garden is doing a terrific job for Philippe Gilbert. Can he guide him to victory? Well, Phil, you may well talk about April showers here, but these are glacial April showers, which keep coming down to dampen the spirits of these bike riders. TJ Van Garden, Phil, 
He's just 23 years of age. He was the co-leader at the start. Now he's sacrificing himself for Philippe Gilbert. He finished 18th overall in this race last year, and I think this year he's actually laying his sights a little bit further up the season because, of course, yes, I believe he's going to be joint leader of Team BMC Racing with Cadell Evans in that upcoming tour of Romandie, but his main goal for the season, he's made no secret about it at all, of course, it's the Amgen Tour of California. Where he finished fifth last year and for the second year in succession won the best young rider competition as well. We're going to see a lot of this man as the years unfold, there's no doubt about that. He hit the front on the slopes of Laladut and he's worked extremely hard since then. These are the survivors now and they are just dangling in front of the peloton. Vasily Kirienka of the uh, Movistar team from Spain is at the back. The other rider is Pierre Roland, he rides for the French Europe car team. And just behind them is one more rider from that breakaway and that is Dario Cataldi who isn't yet caught by the peloton in his trial and there he is to get back to the two leaders. Well, they're over the top of the Côte de la Redoute, and as you can see, this is the sort of damage that the Côte de la Redoute does, which is why you always have to ride close to the front. There is Philippe Gilbert, surrounded by his teammates. He's second in the line there. A little bit further back, you can see one of the, ro the riders from Movistar, the Spanish national champion, J.J. Rojas, and in the pink jersey, just to the left-hand side, when the fluorescent bank, the little prince from Italy, Damiano Cunigo. But still at the front here, it is the Montana Mauler who is really roughing up the peloton now in favour of the rider in second place, his team captain, Philippe Gilbert. It's now down to TJ Van Garden to keep the pressure on for as long as those legs will allow him. What he's done, Paul, is an incredible split. There's only about 30 riders here. The damage is done once again by the Cote de la Redoute. 30 kilometres, 18 miles of racing left to go. And poor old Cataldo, he's had a hard time getting himself back up to these two riders. But now we're looking at a three-man leading group. Cataldo, Kirienka, and on the front, Pierre Roland. Yes, he did win a fantastic stage in the Tour de France last year. He finished fourth overall this year in the Etoile de Bessèges by winning also one of the stages. I think he's part of the Rene of French cycling who until last year were really in the doldrums for many many years but at the Tour de France last year it was almost all about the French. Well as we look down this is the main part of the peloton now still being paced here by TJ Van Garden. We're sorry about the little bit of picture break up there but the weather is coming and going it is extreme at times I have to tell you and heavy cold rain when it comes. Another survivor there just getting caught as well that was David Lelay that leading breakaway of seven riders but I have to tell you something this is an amazing turn being done by TJ Van Garderen this guy as they say in cycling go, jargon film has got a massive engine but today he's not riding for himself this is what it's all about people always think of the sport of professional cycling as an individual sport but it isn't you have to have teammates on this occasion TJ Van Garderen is a teammate of the highest order and just look at this, this is Dario Cataldo here, he still can't get up with those two riders. Those two riders, Roland and Kirienka, they caught up with the breaker, which Cataldo was already a part of. He's been in the lead for much of the day. Our next venue is the Roche au Faucon, and that is the next climb, and that's where we're headed to now. It should all come together. Well, this is an elite group now, but it looks as though on the bottom right there, just taking a drink, that Frank Schleck has made this group. Now, we'll just feel just to come back to Philippe Gilbert, who's sitting in third position there. He said himself in the athlete profile there, and not a lot of people do know him because for a number of years he actually avoided riding the Tour de France, which makes the name for a bike rider. He wanted to concentrate on being a one-day classics rider. Then all of a sudden last year he came back to the Tour de France after missing it for a couple of seasons, and it was a breakthrough season for him, and that has given him much more confidence to ride as a serious leader of a squad. And don't forget, he's a very popular rider in both parts of Belgium. Belgium's a split country politically because they speak Flemish and they speak French. And the Flemish speakers believe they should have their own country. And uh, it's unusual to find a Walloon, who is a French speaker, speaking their language of Flemish. And so he's popular on both sides of the political agenda here in Belgium. And let's not forget, he's pretty popular with us too because he speaks very good English. He started his career off with the small French team of Francais de Jeux for a number of years. And now he's moved across to the mega squad the American BMC to BMC racing team. He is in the front of the main field there as the champion of Belgium, but I've just noticed the champion of Spain is in this group, the champion of Australia, Simon Gerrans, is in this group, and also, a little bit further back, the champion of Italy, Giovanni Visconti. So this really is a serious group of bike riders lining themselves up for the climb, and I'll give you the translation on this occasion, the climb of the mountain of the Falcons.
Yes, and that's where we're bound now, and they'll hit it with 12 miles left to race to the finish. At the moment, we've just 15 miles to go, 24 kilometres, and we are heading towards that climb now. This is uh, was introduced into the race only uh, about four years ago, and since then it's become the swing sp uh, springboard for riders as they head down towards the finish. So I think now we've still got those three riders up front, but they're only 23 seconds ahead, surely on the slopes of the focus. That is where it's going to happen. There are the three riders. The long chase back by Dario Cataldi has worked. It's three riders versus the rest, and it's going to be rendezvous time on the rock. Well, as we look down now from the helicopter here, the riders are heading towards the big climb of the rock au Faucon. The three leaders are still away, but Paul, the 17 seconds, and the peloton still being held up here by BMC. Look at the work they're doing. They have got one man on their agenda here this afternoon at Liège, Baston Liège, or Loc, Bastonoka Loc, as they say it in Flemish, and that is to get Philippe Gilbert into an ideal position to launch the searing attack, just like he did just 12 months ago on the Côte de Saint-Nicolas. But before that, they've got to tackle this next climb of the day, the Côte de Roche au Faucon, which is a climb of 1.7 kilometres in length, or around about one mile. And the sun is out momentarily, at least here, but it's black clouds over Liège, I can tell you. This climb was introduced back in 2008. It's uh, very rapidly become one of the legends of this course. But TJ Van Gorden is still the man setting the pace behind. Look at this man, he's totally insatiable today. Well, one thing you've got to understand, Phil, is when you think that your teammate is going to walk away with a victory, you can push yourself above and beyond the call of duty harder sometimes than you can actually ride for yourself because you know that the man in third position, which is what TJ Van Garder is thinking about, knows the coach of San Nicolau. They probably last night went back to the team bus and watched the videos from last year and saw just how dominant uh, their leader, Philippe Gilbert, was. This is the start now of the Côte de la Roche au Faucon, and it really is a bit of a beast. It is, and now sat at the back here is Kirienka. He's the Russian rider on the Spanish Movistar team. I wonder if he's planning something here. I don't think Pierre Roland would be too frightened of this climb, but these boys are taking a run at it now, and it's TJ Van Garden. How much more strength is in those legs to keep this pace up? He has been on the head of this peloton now for 10 miles. Well, 21 kilometres to go, that's 12 and a half miles. He's done. Oh, and the lights have gone out, but he's done everything that he could, and he's leaving it now back to the team. Now they're handing it slowly over to Philippe Gilbert, who's going to have to take on the role of being team leader. But it looks to me as though that could be uh, the Liquid Gas rider, might well be Nibali down there. He is the rider who is the favourite on Liquid Gas Cannondale. He's come right up onto the shoulder of the man in black, and that's the way it appears from the helicopter of Gilbert. Well, he knows which wheel he wants to follow. He's waiting for the attack of Philippe Gilbert. Gilbert is waiting, but look at the clock, Phil. 11 seconds climbing their way back up through this group of riders. Uh, number 12 is Jan Bakalets, one of the riders from uh, Radio Nissan Trek. He is looking after there on the far side, Frank Schleck, but Frank Schleck is going backwards. This is not the same Frank Schleck that we saw last year in this race. No, but we don't know how much effort he lost there getting back to that group just at the base of Lado Dute and having to get through a melee of riders. He did well to get into this front group at all. Still a half a mile to climb to the summit. Kirienka is now moving clear here as they start to get away from the path. This is not Kirienka, this. Yeah, this is Kirienka. Just a little bit further back, you can notice one man has been dropped. That's Dario Cataldo, which leaves one lone leader. And the lone leader is this man, Pierre Roland. When we looked at Frank Schleck, a former winner on the Alpe d'Huez, getting dropped, this man, the winner at the Alpe d'Huez stage of the Tour de France last year, is making this his new Alpe d'Huez. But his advantage, a mere seven seconds as he gets to the narrow part of this climb. Well, he's really showing great confidence here, the Europe car rider. This is Frank Schleck now. His race is done, I think. He's lower down the slopes here. Now, this is a tough climb. It's only a short. It's about a mile, actually, in length, and it's a climb of 10% or 1 in 10. He is out of this race. His day is done. Well, you can see the body language tells us everything here this afternoon, Phil. There's no more power in the engine room now. Nibali coming to the front 
winner of the Vuelta a España. He's looking for the smoothest part of this road. I'm just looking around him because you can see that this is the move now. They're starting. This is where the move went last year because Nibali now is putting the hammer down. Forget about that 10 second time gap, Phil, that because that has now been wiped away very critically by Vincenzo Nibali. I'm trying to see if I can see the helmet of Philippe Gilbert. He should be there in second or third position, but he now is on the defensive. Well, they can't allow Vincenzo Nibali to go clear here. He is coming up onto the shoulders of Pierre Roland. This is the first time in the main peloton has seen the head of the race for hours upon hours. They're now inside, 12 miles from the finish. Vincenzo Nabali is said to be in extended negotiation to, with his team, Liquid Gas Cannondale, to ride with them till the end of next season. It was in doubt. He says he doesn't want to ride in the Giro d'Italia. He wants to ride in the Amgen Tour of California. And this man's form is coming right on schedule. Phil, he wants to take exactly the same program that he adopted last year. And I tell you what, if he doesn't get his way, he will not be a very happy camp because he really believes that the Amgen Tour of California is an ideal preparation for him to go forward to ride well in the Tour de France. Don't forget, he's a winner of the Vuelta a España. And look at the damage that's being done here because of the coach, De Roche au Faucon. Yes, and he's only the fifth Italian ever to do that as well. So that was an honor in his cap on the day. But also up there too was the Lotto Bello, Bellasol rider, and that was Jella Vanander there, who has come right up. He's got good form. He was second in the Amstel Gold. He was fourth in the Flesh Wallon. And he's just shadowed by Nibali at the moment. We he's the big boy in black, just in the shadow of Nibali. Well, Nibali now takes over command of the front end of this race. They're trying to nail him back. I just noticed Philippe Gilbert putting his head down there, looking at his gears. Now, that is not a good indication. That's an indication that you think you're slightly over-geared. That is Van Dert in second position there as they go over the top of this climb. And third position is Philippe Gilbert. Wow, that was Nabali who held on to go over the top in first place. The Vanander is over. He's got again. Gilbert has got. They've eased up. They have eased up, and he's decided to keep going. Now races are won downhill as well as uphill, and uh, Nabali is turning the screw. You see what happened there, Phil? Everyone got to the top of the climb and went, oof, thank God, goodness me for that, because all of a sudden, straight over the top, Nabali said, boys, I'm still in good form here. You can come and chase me if you want to. And the man taking that responsibility is last year's winner, Philippe Gilbert. Now is Vincenzo Nabali flying away from Falcon's Rock and heading towards the finish at Ars. He is only 11 and a half miles to go. They've recognized the danger. He's being chased there by Jelle Van Andert, but also Gilbert is in the move. But look at the peloton. They are in bits now, and I could say they are in panic. Well, the man trying to pull him back there, of course, at Philippe Gilbert, defending champion of Liège, Baston Liège. There's a little bit of confusion there. That's one of the race referees putting his hand up as an indicator that he was not going to accelerate. He wants the rider to go by him. This again, Phil, is on the very treacherous little descent away from the Côte de la Roche au Faucon. Next climb on the horizon will be the Côte de Saint-Nicolas, and that is a beast of a climb. It's the steepest climb, I think, of this whole race. And there, all of a sudden, look at that. These guys are starting to slow down. They're trying to decide do we chase or don't we? Well, I'll give them a little piece of advice. You need to chase right now because Vincenzo Nibali is starting to opening himself up a serious little gap. Well, this is Pierre Roland here who has come back to the fold again, but he's still active here, Paul. He's putting in another little attack. He's got to be tired. He's been a long time in the breakaway. He was swept up, but look at that face, and it's hurting. But still Nibali. Now, all of this cat and mouse behind, the regrouping of about 10 or 15 riders are back there. Is going to be to the advantage of this man. He's now free to get on with the job, but he's not sure himself. Well, Nibali himself won the uh, Terreno Adriatico in the early part of this season. Uh, we can just see this is uh, another group out on the road, the second group of chasers now forming behind Vincenzo Nibali. Yes, and the rider for Katusha there, and I've almost forgotten about uh, Rodriguez, but he's got to be in there somewhere. This is Daniel Moreno, his teammate, who's had himself two wins this year. He's now trying to muster up the chase behind, but the advantage is to the breakaway here as we dodge in and out of the trees and out of sight. Look in the distance on the left, because this is the group on the right who is shortly to come round that far corner. And it's a very select group indeed. Number 21 is Enrico Gasparotto. He's the rider who won on top of the hill in Valkenberg in the Amstel Gold Race a week ago. He's a danger. Gilbert is still there. Well, Gilbert is getting himself a caught out of fraction there because, again, these riders insisting to try and get across the gap. We're in the undulating part of the course now between the Roche au Faucon and the Côte de Saint-Nicolas. And this, of course, is a Thomas Vocler there wearing number 131.
Yes, and alongside him here, near his camera, the, the, is Astana's uh, Robert Kielowski. He's a Croatian rider, but he's suddenly turning in some excellent one-day rides in the Classics, and he's into the kill again today. As he continues now, uh, Kieskowski is number 26, and just up there too is Maxim Iglinski, number 25. He's a Kazakhstan rider. Well, these riders, Phil, are scuttling across one by one, but all of this adds a little bit to the confusion, because don't forget, Vincenzo Nibali is on the front end of this bike race. There is Thomas Vokler in second position, just looking at the rider alongside him to see whether or not he's got the power to get across that gap. Vokalo has a very strange position on his machine, but I tell you what, when he knows how to turn on the gas, he really does it in style. Well, he won one race this year, a semi-classic here in Belgium, the Brabantia Pile, or the Brabant Arrow, if you want the English interpretation. That looks as though it might be Gasparotto moving off the front there. Team Astana, Phil, are in a very good situation here. Three riders from Team Astana when we come down to the final few riders left. So this could be a very good move here by Gasparotto. He is in fine form, as you said. He won a race just a week ago, the Amstel Gold Race, and he's going to try and ride across this gap. I'm thinking it's around about 15 seconds now to the lone leader with 16 kilometers to go. But he does have a very long ride until he gets to the bottom of the final climb of the day, the Côte de Saint-Nicolas. It's about 10 kilometers or six miles before he gets to the next climb of the day. Yeah, and it's very difficult finish into the finish at Arns too. I'm not sure whether Nibali just, just did a reaction to break away here, whether it's planned or not. He may have misjudged the distance to the finish here because these riders behind, although they split the chase, there's some strong men back here now. You might just notice on the sleeves there of Gasparotto, uh, the green, white and red stripes, an indicator of former national champion of Italy. This breakaway is not organised. This chase wake group, I have to say, is not organised for the moment. Just looking at 41, that's a Joachim Rodriguez. Now, he's a man there who won just a few days ago when he went to the summit of the Mur de Huy, and they all have one thing in common to try and pull back Vincenzo Nibali. Well, these three Ardennes classics, which is the Amstel Gold Race in Holland, the Flesch Wallon in Belgium, and this one, all finish on top of a hill. It absolutely suits the riding style of Rodriguez, and he knows it, and he's back in at the kill again. But that little group behind is closing in. Well, that's Philippe Gilbert who's doing all the work. There you can see his uh, jersey, the national champion of Belgium, black, yellow and red on his shoulders. He looks across for some help and assistance here. Come on, guys. This is the crucial part of the race. Very shortly, they will start a long descent down to the uh, River Meuse, across there, past the Liège Stadium, and then they have that final climb of the day. And the man moving ahead now is Dan Martin of Garmin Barracuda. The Irish tell you there's never been a, a climber quite like Dan Martin, apart from Stephen Roach, of course, and Sean Kelly. But he is now making his move towards the finish. This is still anybody's race. Now, looking down from the helicopter, they're trying to organise the chase. Has this man gone too soon or not? He went on the descent of the Roche au Faucon and he's now desperate because he's nine miles from the finish and there's hills to come. There is one nasty hill to come, the Côte de Saint-Nicolas. Well, he will get a lot of support there because uh, the Côte de Saint-Nicolas is at the bottom of the climb. They call the area of Little Italy, where a lot of the immigrants moved up to Liège just after the Second World War to work in the iron and steel factories here. And when we get there, you will see the Italian flags, although we are in Belgium, will fly very, very high indeed. Well, the last Italian to win this race was Danilo De Luca in 2007, and that was just two years after Vincenzo Nibali turned pro. Now, he's heading just seconds ahead now. This, uh, I just caught a sight at the back here, the Olympic champion, Samuel Sanchez, has just latched onto the back of this group now. He, one of his team, Igor Anton, had a bizarre crash at the start of the race today. He fell off before the race even began and broke his collarbone. Yeah, that was bad luck for Uscatel Uscadi to have a man like Igor Anton crash out. But I tell you one thing, Sammy Sanchez is a very good competitor when it comes to the end of a race like this. Apologies a little bit for the camera, but Phil, but because of the, uh, the temperature changes, we're actually getting condensation on the inside of the lens. That is Maxim Iglinski going around that corner. This is the second group of riders on the road, but we're still looking at a gap back to this group, which is being led by Philippe Gilbert. He's trying to pull himself back in to Liège, Baston Liège, and he needs to do that before we get to the start of the final climb of the day. Well, the topsy-turvy weather of April here in Belgium, bright sunshine for the chasers, seconds up the road, they're racing towards a big black cloud over Liège. Well, Nibali knows he's committed himself now. He's got to keep going. This is his only chance. If he slows, they'll catch him, but he can't afford to do that. 
Well, he's been a professional since 2005. He's 27 years of age, but I have to say, I think the crowning glory of his career was when he won the Vuelta a España. Everyone has always tipped this man as a top finisher in the Tour de France, and that's exactly what he wants to try and prepare him for this, prepare himself for this year. As we now see, just getting onto the back there, we've got uh, Pierre Roland. A little, I think this group is all coming together now, but the black clouds are really starting to rise in the horizons. We've got about 11 or 12 riders in that chasing group now. I don't see anybody else getting up to it because the pressure is fully on. 12.8 kilometers to go, seven and a half miles to the finish, but it's not an easy road this. We'll race into the streets of Liège, we'll cross Liège and we'll climb out to the finishing line in Hans. And Nibali knows if he's made a mistake or not, inside he knows he's got to keep going now. As well, an attack at the front. Well, as soon as it came to it, it looks like a Lamprey rider has gone straight off the front here. As soon as that group all came back together, then all of a sudden there was another attack going off the front. This is uh, Bauk Molema sitting on the back, 126 in the orange jersey. Gilbert now, Phil, has not got any friends at all in this group. We're now seven kilometres or four miles away from the, the climb of the Côte de San Nicolas. So this man leading here, Vincenzo Nibali, has got to hold a little bit in reserve because I tell you what, it's a real nasty climb, this final climb of the day. Well, it's not the prettiest approach to the finish, I have to admit, but we're nipping down the back streets here now, a sharp right turn, they're all in the favour of the breakaway. He really did put a speed wobble on there for the right-hand bend, but he straightened it up nicely. The roads are drying out from the recent rain. I think that might have been Scarponi because I don't think anybody else is here for Lamprey. Well, look at the gap though now, 25 seconds, still looking calm and collected. Where's number one? That, of course, is Philippe Gilbert. There's the Liège football ground, the riders will go past there, turn left at the end of the street, about a three or four kilometre ride along the flat through the beautiful industrial area of Liège, and then into Little Italy, where the Italian fans will come out to shout for Vincenzo Nibali, who is now holding on to a 24-second advantage. This is a real workman-like group, group now, but how many are passengers, how many are driving? Because they know they've got Philippe Gilbert. Gilbert has never looked that comfortable, despite all that great work by TJ Van Gogh. And there he is, again sitting nearly at the back of the breakaway. 24 seconds, just behind him there is Bauk Malima, uh, the rider from Holland. He's also looking for a good ride today. And what's this? A little bit of a move going off the front now with Rodriguez driving it. Number 41, uh, there he is. This is Sammy Sanchez. He's seen the danger too, I think, because he's uh, again seen a little bit of a split here and he's trying to get himself onto the wheel. Over the River Meurs now for this man, Vincenzo Nibar. Look at the time gap now, though. It's stretching out to 37 seconds. Looks across there to the neutral service uh, motorbike there with spare wheels, looking to see if they can give him any little bit of further information. Well, we're looking at the Italian, Vincenzo Nibali here, as he tries to hang on, but his lead is more than hanging on. It is going up to 40 seconds now. Now, Italy have won this race 12 times in history out of a possible 97. Is this lucky 13 coming? Now, this is a chase group. Iglinski's there, and so too Rodriguez. They've gone away from this group. Well, we've got three or four kilometres, about two miles to the start of the final climb of the day. There's a Garmin Barracuda rider leaping off the front here as we now start to get ourselves lined up for the next big climb Dan of the Martin. day. Dan that is Martin. Dan Martin. Dan Martin has made a move. He's been showing, and I think he's repaying everybody's faith here in him because the Irishman on the American squad is a very good rider. Pierre Rowland is the man going with him, and I don't know where he's finding the strength. He's had a great race today. Well, it's still Vincenzo Nibali inching out his lead a second by second, and he's going to need a few seconds once he gets to this nasty little climb, because I tell you, it really is a beast, this penultimate climb, because nobody really counts the final climb of the day up to the finishing line in Oz. It's a categorised climb, but I will tell you this, Phil, it is all uphill to the finishing line. It is very, very difficult indeed, and you must judge your final effort to perfection. The board up there is indicated to Nibali what is going on, and now uh, let me try and assess the race for you. We've got the lead of 42 seconds back. These two riders, Iglinski and Rodriguez. Then we go back to the next chase group, Dan Martin, Pierre Roland. Roland wants, won't go through. Martin wants some help. And behind these two are this lot. Led well, by Gilbert. Led by Philippe Gilbert. You might just have spotted the Italian flag starting to appear here. Little Italy, this is the little enclave of the Italians who migrated up here just after the Second World War. But this group, Phil, this group is not chasing. They've cut down the effort in the group here. And that is going to give oh. the advantage now to Nibali and the other two groups ahead of them. 
At five miles to go, you can't afford to freewheel and assess. They're all sitting on last year's winner there, Philippe Gilbert. And that is Kurtz for that group. Believe me, the winner is one of the first five riders on the road. This man is going onto the climb of the Côte de Saint-Nicolas with the big advantage. Now, if he's tired, this is where we're going to see it. Yep, it's 1.5 kilometres in length, but the last 500 metres, Phil, once you get up to the top, it tips up to 18%, and that's when you've got to go to the small chain ring on the inside of your machine and the larger sprocket at the back, because that's where you need that last little bit of energy. These two riders, though, they are a long way behind. It's Iglinski doing the pacemaking now to share with this man who won just a few days ago in the flesh on Joachim Rodriguez. 43 seconds for the leader over these two riders. I make that 13 minutes to ride to the finish, 13 minutes to suffer and then become the next Italian to win this race. It is 42 seconds, seven kilometers. Normally that would be enough, but I'm not sure that Nibali is that good right now. But there's only four riders I think Paul can stop him and they're still racing pretty hard. I think this group is out of it. There's still a kilometre from the top of the climb. A kilometre to go to the top of this climb, and when you're looking at this kind of gradient, you're probably looking at around about two and a half minutes. Out of the saddle now, trying to find a comfortable gear, but he's got a good advantage. 44 seconds is his advantage, and let's not forget, if you want a race like the Vuelta a Espana, you know how to climb climbs like this one. But Philippe Gilbert, Phil, I think he's laid down arms here this afternoon because he's just sitting at the back of the pack. Well, this is how he's ridden the classics this year, at the back, unlike last year when he was at the front winning all three. Oh, oh. There's a drop rider here, and it is Joachim Rodriguez who's been left by Maxim Iglinski, who has ridden away. He's now got a bridge 45 seconds. He's still losing ground. 45 seconds if he's going to win this. Well, Iglinski now has left uh, Joachim Rodriguez behind. That's a bit of a surprise for me because Rodriguez was so dominant just days ago at the top of the Mule de Gui when he bounced away from the rest of the pack to get himself a, a really dominating win. This is uh, Nibali here as he goes through the crowd here. He's out of the saddle. All he's got to do is get to the top of this climb and then he can just change the gears and start to pick up the pacemaking once again. But after a long breakaway like this, those legs are really... Ah, oh, Gilbert makes a reaction that I've been waiting for. Well, he knows he's got to go here. You get by the angle of the bike just how hard well, he this climb is. That's Samuel Sanchez just in front of him. In fact, Gilbert's being dropped here. He has been dropped by the group. He was sitting at the back. Gilbert, last year's winner, is out of it. And this man is trying to get into it because he's 46 seconds and six kilometers, three and a half miles to go. I am very surprised about Philippe Gilbert because his teammates had complete confidence in him. They worked hard. Nibali now knows he's just going to get over the top of this climb. But look, this is the steepest part of the climb I was telling you about. It's around about 18% team manager up alongside him saying look if you can press the top of this climb with a 30 second advantage Liège, Baston Liège is going to be added to your pedigree as a bike rider well the Americans could claim half the victory if he gets there because this team is co-sponsored by Cannondale Bikes they're in America and now as we go down the hill here this is a closing in of Dan Martin Pierre Roland are sweeping up the winner of Flesh Wallon now Dan Martin is on the ride of his life here he had a great end to the year last year he was second in the great Italian classic the Giro de Lombardia he's brought that form here today well coming up now to second place over the top of the climb and it's still with five and a half kilometers three miles to go 45 seconds the gap between Nibali and of course Iglinski but that time gap is locked at 46 seconds it's neither going up nor down at the moment as we're now watching Nibali going under the lotto sign here now a little bit of respite from the clients but they still want to come to the finish he's still looking okay because the clock is telling us he's still got a big gap well, he's still got a huge gap now. He's got to get into time trial mode. This is the flattest part of the course. He's going to zigzag a little bit through this small town of Anse, which is an outskirt of the city of Liège. And then it's a big climb up. It's around about a one and a half kilometre false flat up to the finish. That, that's not 45 seconds no way. because there is a Glitzky. I reckon that was about 12 or 13 seconds the distance between the lone leader, Vincenzo Nibali, and Maxim Iglinski. Well, I think the clock has stopped, quite frankly, and it's been locked in because it's not going, and that's the answer to that because the helicopter has showed us 
There's no way that Nibali has got three quarters of a minute. Iglinski is closing in on him. Well, if you look on the right-hand side, you can see the red car in the distance there. That is the red car of the race referee. The race referee is behind Vincenzo Nibali. In fact, I think they're pulling everybody out of the gap now because even the race referees are being caught out by the way the Maxime Miglinski is coming across this gap. Let's not forget, Bill, these guys are coming to the end of a 160-mile race, and it's all down to the last two or three miles that will decide who's going to win the bike race this afternoon. Now, does Vincenzo Nibali know exactly where that rider is behind him? He's racing into the clouds of doom, I think, here in Arns, that black. This is back in the chase group. There's Rodriguez peeping in and out of our picture. Scarponi is here. Roland is here, and uh, Brody Hegedal is here as well. He did a great ride in the flesh wall on. He's in at the kill this time around, but he won't be in for the first place. Well, you might have noticed Pierre Roland, although he didn't collaborate very much with Dan Martin there, all of a sudden when he saw his teammate Thomas Vogler come back into the group, he said, right, now I've got to sacrifice myself. I'm putting myself on the line, because when it comes down to it, Thomas Vogler, the Frenchman, the former champion of France, is a very good finisher. Well, empty road ahead for Maxim Iglinski as we go around the corner. We pick up the lone battling figure of Vincenzo Nibali as he dodges round the narrow street. Still his advantage round these streets because he's out of sight. He's certainly not out of mind. Will the helicopter tell us anything different here? One is round the top corner. This is the man about to take that same corner. I reckon it's 10 seconds. I was just going to say 10 seconds is the gap between these two riders. Now, what could be a bit of a surprise here if Nibali's been taking information from the blackboard, which gives all of the riders information, he's been telling him 45 seconds all of the time, he will have been fairly relaxed, thinking, guys, I've got this one on the bag, and he may well not be getting up-to-date information because now his team car is no longer behind him. All he's got to do in one of these straights is look back, and he will see the shadow of Iglinski coming up on him. There he looks. Over the broken road, of the back side of Liège now as we head to Arns and the finish. He, somebody's told him he's now looking over his shoulder. He no longer feels that confidence. He's picking the shortest way to the finishing line. Well, it's the telltale sign. Once you see the red car getting pulled past the rider, the rider knows that the gap is starting to come down rapidly because the race referees make sure they keep the gap between riders as sterile and as clean as possible there he is. so as not to falsify it. It's around about eight seconds now. This man has got the advantage. Iglinski can see the rider he needs to catch him and judge his effort to perfection and he knows now meter by meter he can slowly pull himself back to the lone leader Vincenzo Nibali. It's always a bit of chaos when you come down to the end of Liège, Baston Liège I'm not exactly sure exactly where the other group of riders is behind but they can't be very much more than about 30 seconds either. Well, whichever way it goes, Iglinski is on an inspired ride here because he's not a winner, you know. He's only won one race in a career which started back in 2004, and that was in February 2010. But here he comes. He is closing the gap before the climb starts. That is less than five seconds now. I think Nibali has realised what's happened. He's going to sit up, he's going to try and recuperate, and this may well go down to a two-man sprint all the way down to the finish line because you can see there, metre by metre, the rider in the turquoise jersey of Astana is slowly but surely trying to find the back wheel of the leader here, Vincenzo Nibali. This is the long drag now, Phil, up to the outskirts of, of uh, the town of Ons, and then there's a left-hand turn at the top, and then it's the sprint in front of you. And here comes the catch, I think, and Nibali, has he got the legs to lift it? This is a cruel fate for the Italian if it's going to be this way. They're both riding left, so the move can only come on the right-hand side. He's looked over his shoulder. He swung over to the right. He can't believe this. He's just double-checking who is this rider coming up. Just in the distance there, across the road, you can see uh, the red kite. That's the indicator that there's just a kilometre to go. Yes, the Italian flags are flying high, but now there are two leaders. Well, I take my hat off to Iglinski. I said he'd only won one race. I, I'm sorry about that. In fact, he's won eight races. There is the kite, one kilometre to the finish, and there comes the attack. He's not waiting. He's caught him about 13, 1,400 metres from the finishing line, and he's kicked again, and now Nibali has sold himself. He's got nothing left. Well, he looks down there, looks down at those gears, and the gap is now starting to appear. That was a very crafty move by Iglinski. He could see that the man in front of him was weakening. He put down a kick, he put a second kick in, and opened up the gap. He does not want to drive the ground there. Vincenzo Nibali to the finishing line. This is an amazing performance here by Astana. Remember a couple of years ago, it was Astana who won with uh, Alexander Vinokurov. That's right, 2005 and 2010, the only Kazakhstan rider ever to win Liège, Baston at Liège. 
and he's been through disgraceful times since then with drug accusations, etc. But now this is a man from Astana who's going to win as well. Now, has he gone too soon? He's kept his gears down nicely. We switch back to the chase group, which split. This is going to bring Gilbert, I think, back in because they're coming back together, this group. Well, this is Gasparotto on the front there in the turquoise jersey. He's trying to bring the group together there. You can see slipping away, still opening that gap is Iglinski, but the group behind Phil, that group with Philippe Gilbert and the rest of the big name favourites, they don't look to me as if they're really chasing in earnest. This rider has not finished in the top 10 in one of the classic races since 2010 when he finished eighth in the Tour of Flanders. And here he is, poised now to win the 98th edition of Liège Baston Liège because Nibali must now worry if he can get second. He certainly isn't going to get the win. Oh, he's struggling. Just looking at his style there as we got the split screen for a moment. He was certainly in all kinds of difficulty while this rider is still looking supple. He's out of the saddle, waiting for that left-hand turn when eventually when he gets to it, he will see the finishing line in front of him. But that gap is stretching open. I've got it to more than 10 seconds now. And look at Nibali there in the background, drops his head down. He's a man who has been defeated here this afternoon. Kilometers ago, he thought he was going to win and now all of a sudden he's got to hope he can hold on for second place. And this is the flag, a regional flag of Luxembourg flying on the right, but there's no Schleck brothers fighting this one out. Instead, it's a rider from Kazakhstan and the, only the second rider from that nation ever to win at Liege, Baston Liege. Six and three quarter hours. He's time to salute the crowd now and punch the air. A brilliant race, Paul. You've got to feel sorry for Nibali, but the chase by this rider was one of the best we've seen for years. And I have to say, Astana had a lot of riders still in with the kill when it came down to the run to the finish line. I never would have put the name Maxine Iglinski down at the top of the favourites to win this bait race this afternoon. He got on, but he got everything right. And look at that average speed, only 38 kilometres an hour. Well, I think that's pretty miles quick. An that's, hour that's a race like this. Well, it's a very hilly race indeed as it comes up. And now Nibali has hung on for second place. He'll be desperately sorry. So close to victory, just on a kilometre from the line. He was caught and now he's had to be content with second place. Now, the group has come back together on the climb, and here they come, and it is going to be, is Gasparotto going to give Astana a perfect day? A challenge by Tommy Voigtla on the right, Dan Martins in the middle, Gasparotto gets third, Astana have taken first and third, but they have been a team of this race and indeed a team of the classics this year. Very dominant, that's what it's about when you want to win classics, you have to have strength in numbers, but that was a brilliant ride by the young Dan Martin. I thought a couple of seasons ago that Dan Martin was going to be a bike rider who was uh, going to be dogged by illness and injury, but all of a sudden he's turning into a top man. Astana, by the way, uh, takes his title as the capital city of Kazakhstan, is Astana, and uh, a number of companies have clubbed together to make this team possible, and now this man Iglinski has delivered for his country. That is a great result. Now, I was about to tell you, I didn't see Gilbert finish, and that's why he hadn't. And here he comes now. But look at the crowd. They're welcoming Philippe Gilbert home. He was very much a part of the race. You can't win them every time you try, can you? Well, he had such an incredible season last year with 24 victories. I think he's having a hard time getting himself back together this year. There is Damiano Cunigo right in the middle there in the fluorescent jersey, uh, in the fluorescent bike there for Team Lamprey, Frank Schleck over to the right hand side in the black shoulder jersey and the white helmet but these guys are a long way down well outside of the winnings and that looks like Simon Gerrans going for the acceleration just coming around the outside. It is indeed the champion of Australia and the winner of Milan San Remo this year that was a terrific result for Simon Gerrans a big classic in Italy the longest of them all this is Rui Costa of Movistar he's a good sprinter looks at everybody and just about is holding off the bunch here as Julian Simon there, he's the bright young hope on the uh, Seu Sejourn team there who's come in just behind him. But they're just about scraping in, I think, to the top 20 places. Yeah, well, that really was all to do with the final two big climbs of the day, the Côte de Rocho Faucon and the Saint-Nicolas. It proved to be one climb too far, I think, for uh, Philippe Gilbert here this afternoon because uh, Gilbert disappearing away as quickly as possible. He came in, he rode like a, a leader, he used his team to perfection, but nobody expected this man, I don't think, Phil, to come out of the pack just the way he did. Well, if we'd have been asked to pick a winner, I don't think before the start, any anyone would have mentioned the name of Maxime Iglinski. He had a brother also on the team who wasn't riding today, 
This was his first win since he won the Strada Bianca in Italy in March of 2010. And it's one he'll remember for the rest of his life because it's his very first classic win and he's won the oldest of them all, La Doyenne, Liège, Baston Liège. What a result, and he didn't win it by any manner of luck, he won it by a real show of strength. Well, he knew the winning move was off the front when he saw Vincenzo Nibali, and that's why he made the effort at the right time when he managed to peg that man back slowly on the slopes of the Côte de saint Nicolas. Well done, Alex, as we go to the podium now. All smiles for the man from Astana. Yes, Astana dominating this race, uh, first and third place on the finishing line and the bodes well I think for the upcoming races to come so he's welcomed on the podium there alongside him is Nibali to the right and then a teammate in Enrico Gasparotto completing a perfect day out well almost for the riders from Astana they have had a tremendous season even without Alexander Vinokurov their leader but for now from Paul Show and me Phil Liggett goodbye <laughs>